Tech Cocktail Sessions, educational and inspirational talks from experienced startup founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders. Here we go. Everyone grab a seat. We'll get started here in a second. Those of you in the back, finish those conversations. And there's a front row seat right here. There you go. She's taking it. All right. Um, I'm Frank Gruber, the CEO and co-founder of Tech Cocktail. Uh, we're a media company covering tech startups and entrepreneurship around the country. Uh, we do different types of events. Uh, a lot of you have been probably to some of our, our mixer style events where we showcase startups. Uh, we've been working with cars.com now for a year and a half uh, to, to host this event uh, where we're actually bringing speakers in and giving an opportunity to, to share their knowledge with you guys. And you guys get to interact and ask questions, so have those questions ready. Uh, tonight, though, it's a special one because it's been... Um, you know, a long year. This is our last event uh, in Chicago this year, and I think it's it's our last event, if I'm if I'm not correct, the last event of the year for us that we're not you know we're hosting ourselves. So it's been a long year. We've done a lot, uh, and I'm excited to kind of get to the point where we're actually at, at the holiday season and we can take a, a breath for like a minute. <laughs> so um, all right. So big thank you to Cars.com. Uh, we're gonna I'm gonna introduce you to uh, Kevin Steele here in a moment, and he's gonna share some some more about what they're up to. Uh, Apartments.com as well, uh, they're here in, in the house, and uh, Modus, who, who are the sponsors for tonight. Uh, we also have our partners, Hoffman Media, uh, Gen X uh, USA, uh, Saper Law, and fr &R. they're all here, so you get a chance, to, if you have a chance, go and talk to them, uh, as well as our partners that are more national partners, like American Airlines, who get us, gets us everywhere, uh, and wants to, wants to connect with startup founders and business, uh, business owners as they you know, want to really help uh, you get to where you need to go. Uh, as well as .co, we're at tech.co. It's a lot shorter than Tech Cocktail, so we decided to make the move about a year and a half ago. Uh, saved you guys a lot of time and typing. And some exciting news, actually, on that same front. This week we had a launch. Uh, if you go, how many people read Tech Cocktail regularly? You don't have to hear me. I just want to know. Wow, no one. <laughs> awesome. Uh, no, so tech.co, if you didn't notice, uh, went got a face facelift on Monday. Uh, we launched it kind of quietly on Sunday night. Uh, and for the first thing Monday morning has a new new design. Uh, you can go now to tech.co and you'll notice there's a national kind of drop down and ed addition drop down. You can kind of pull down your city, so Chicago, uh, and check out what's happening in your local city. It also includes local events and different things. We're going to continue to iterate on that within the next few months and forever. So to save you even more time, now you can go to tech.co slash Chicago just to get Chicago related news, or you can go back to the national page. So. Check it out if you haven't already. It also works on your mobile phones. You probably all have those. You can even look right now. So get a chance and, and check it out. All right, so I want to introduce you to Kevin Steele. Uh, he's a CTO at cars.com. Super excited to be working with cars uh, now for a year and a half. And he's going to come up and introduce our special speaker tonight. Let's hear it for Kevin. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Good evening, and uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Got another great crowd. Um, just want to thank you all for uh, following the cars.com speaker series. This is our fourth and final event, as Frank mentioned, and we're committed to, uh, to doing this again next year. So we'll bring more great speakers uh, to, uh, to this venue, and um, we're looking forward to kind of moving into the holidays, like Frank said, and, and, uh, and getting ready for uh, presentations for next year. So uh, without further ado, I want to thank our speaker that's going to be here tonight. Uh, Jason Freed, who is the co-founder of 37 Signals, a company that uh, produces web-based uh, collaboration tools. And uh, Frank and Jason are going to do a fireside chat with some Q&A. So we're looking forward to uh, hearing some insights from our speaker. And uh, without further ado, we'll bring him on. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. Thought you could get rid of me. <laughs> I'm back. And apparently touching my mic. Or was that you? I don't know. It's, okay. some good. it's hot. It's a hot, hot mic. mic. Yeah. Hot mic tonight. Got the hot light and the hot mic. Got my blue sweater on. You got yours on. We're ready. Hot crowd. Hot crowd. Yeah. Look at that. Woo. Let's hear it for the crowd. <laughs> Big crowd. There's over 300 some people signed up. 3,000 people. 3,000 people yeah, 3, came out tonight yeah. to see this. So anyway. What's going on? Well, I don't know. I'm waiting for some questions. Yeah, yeah, no, that, go was for first, it. no. that was the first. I've been thinking that about that question. question because it's been Good literally question. 2016 days since our first conference that you were going to speak at. Wow. And I've been waiting for this moment. Come on. 
I'm serious. Five years, six months, and six days. I'm glad to be here. Finally. <laughs> I know. It's I know. About, so it's about time. I know. Yeah. Time. Well, so you got. I think you got a bug that time, and so you didn't, couldn't make it. I was busy. Yeah, I was oh. busy. No, I was sick. Actually, I was. <laughs> I know. I, I heard was sick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's true. That's true. <laughs> So every day I say that little prayer, Jason Free, can you come back? You know. It happened. I know. So anyway, it's finally here. So first off, I want to start out for people that don't know everything that you've been up to for the last, you know, twenty years or whatever. We're not gonna go that that long in detail, but let's give us kind of a refresher. How did you get started? Like what what's put you in this position of, you know, you're writing books and you're doing product development sure. and stuff? And yeah, I started um, as a freelance web designer basically mm -hmm. in uh, two thousand five, two thousand six. Right when the web was starting to happen for the first time, no one knew what they were doing. I didn't know what I was doing, but um, I figured it out. And so I started doing that, and then I got a job working for someone in San Diego. So I moved to San Diego for a while, did some work out there. But I realized pretty quickly that I was not really built to work for other people. Um, I like working with people, but I wasn't really good at for people. So uh, I quit, and I moved back to Chicago and started freelancing again. And then in 1999, I, I joined up with a couple other guys and started 37 Signals, also as a web design firm. Um, we got really busy uh, in around 2002, 2003, and needed a better way to manage all the projects that we were doing for clients. Mm -hmm. um, so we looked around at software that existed at the time, we weren't really happy with it, built our own tool that we used internally, uh, and our clients were like, what is this thing? Like, well, we have projects, you know. We need to manage them. We use email. Like, what is this thing you're using? We're like, it's this thing we made. Mm -hmm. uh, light bulb goes off. Other people need it too. Turned it into a product in 2004. Basecamp was launched in 2004, February 5th, in fact. So it's almost 10 years old. Wow. Uh, and we've been doing that pretty much ever since. We have other products as well. But Basecamp's right. our main product. We've written a few books and stuff. But that's that's how it all got started. It was slow. Just kind of doing something. New opportunity comes along, do that, see what happens, do that, and then uh, you know, 15 years later, basically, we're in here. Success. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you have been. You've been chugging along for a while. So that's yeah. pretty. What was the? What kind of drove you into like product? I mean, the design side of it and everything. Because you're very focused on good design and keeping it simple and all that. I've I've loved products forever, so as mm -hmm. far as I can remember. When I was um, in college, I made this FileMaker Pro software. Mm -hmm. I didn't make FileMaker Pro, but I used FileMaker Pro. Anyone here knows what FileMaker Pro is? It's like a database thing, um, and you can make you can make applications and then right. save them as like a runtime version, which people can install. Anyway, uh, I had a lot of I was a kind of a music not a collector, but I liked a lot of music, and I had a lot of cassette tapes and you know bootlegs and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And I wanted a better way to organize those, and so um, I went on AOL at the time because the internet wasn't around really yet. And uh, they I owned on, it. They owned the internet. At that they point. did. They did. <laughs> Basically, it was like that was what the internet was. Right. Well, yeah. And I went on there and I tried to find some tools that existed. Hated them all. Didn't work. So I made my own. I put it up on AOL, uh, and 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 said like, if you like it, send me twenty dollars. And um, I think about, I, I feel like it was a few months, and I got an envelope in the mail. I was living at home. Um, my parents gave me this envelope. It was like an airmail envelope. It had like the red and blue little checks on the top of it. And I opened it up, and there's a printed out for screenshot of my product called mm -hmm. Audiophile, mm -hmm. um, with 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 a little handwritten note. Love this product. Thank you very much. It was sent in from Germany with a twenty dollar bill, U.S. twenty dollar bill. Wow. And that was the first time I ever got paid <laughs> to make something. <laughs> and I'm like, this Germany. is this is great. I can make something. I can put it somewhere, and people can pay me for it. Yeah. And that's, and that's how when the light bulb went on. <laughs> yeah, that's really when the light bulb went yeah, on right. about product. Right. And then I didn't really make product for quite a long time until right. 2004 again. But mm -hmm. um, I've always loved the idea of making something, putting your best effort forward, putting it out there, putting a price on it, and having people buy it if they mm -hmm. think it's worth it. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, so you've been doing 37 singles. First off, 37 singles, what does that mean? Just so people, people <laughs> don't know. It doesn't really mean anything, okay. is actually the, the truth. But I'll tell you where the name came from. Mm -hmm. um, one of my original partners in the business, a guy named Carlos Segura, mm -hmm. was watching uh, Nova. You guys know Nova? Yeah, I love Nova. PBS show, yeah. science show. It's hard not to watch it. It's a great it's show. Turned on, it's like it's it's awesome. Yeah. It's a great show, and he was watching the show, and they were talking about the SETI project, which is a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I it's would like, have definitely watched that one. Yes, <laughs> me too. If I knew it was on at the yeah. time. Yeah. Bunch of satellite dishes in Nevada, I think, or yeah, Nevada, listening for signs of life, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, New Mexico. I forget where it was. Anyway, yeah. out of the billions of signals that they'd analyzed, there's just noise, random noise. There were 37 signals that were unexplained and wow. signs of potential intelligent life. Wow. Carlos had heard this this idea that there were 37 signals, and he really liked that. 
right. didn't have a name for the company. Uh, so he's like, what do you think of 37 Signals? We're like, we love it. Domain's available. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. <laughs> um, and so we did. And that's that's what it means. But it has nothing to do with what we No, but that's a great story, too. The origin story. Of it's cool. From. It's cool. It was just like, you know, na I love naming things. Right. Um, and this wasn't something I named, but I really right. love the name. But I, I love naming things. It's really fun to do. Yeah. What's it? Do you have one quick tip on how you name things? Uh, yeah, I do. I don't check the thesaurus. So a lot of people go to the thesaurus to name stuff. They're like, yeah. we're going to make a writing app, so let's see what the you know, synonyms Word for writing, writing are and all this shit. And it's like, you'll, you'll just end up down a, a terrible, terrible path. Mm -hmm. um, I just wait for things to come to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I try and think about associate, like word association. Mm -hmm. So for example, Basecamp um, came to me because um, a project is a journey. Mm -hmm. And you, you start somewhere, and you move, and then you kind of gather again, and then you, you keep going, and you gather again. And like that's what a base camp is when you're climbing a mountain. You right. know? So that sort of that kind of association is a great way to look, rather than being super uh, explicit about it, but kind of going like one ring out from, from there. there. Cool, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, so not looking at the source, have you ever looked at a crossword puzzle dictionary? Dictionary? No. Yeah, that's... so you can almost reverse engineer what you're trying to say. Oh, no, I haven't seen that. That might be a good tip. Yeah, check that out. All right. Sweet. <laughs> I'm just curious. If you have like name block, which is so easy, and you, if you don't, the other thing I would say is if you're if you're trying to name something and you don't come up with it in like ten minutes, yeah. don't keep thinking because you won't get it mm -hmm. then. Um, just like let it go yeah. and you'll get it tomorrow. Perfect. Okay. Um, so you've been doing this for a while now, thirty seven signals. How have you stayed so engaged and just focused and what kind of drives you to do it every day? Uh, I think you have to just be intrinsically motivated by what you do. So I, I love working with great people, I love making things. Mm -hmm. I love making things better. I love solving problems. I love simplifying things. And all those things that I like happen to be like what we do with the company. And so right. um, because of that, I'm constantly motivated to do it. Mm -hmm. There have been times when I've been like, I should take a year away. Mm -hmm. like, there's been times when I felt like, uh, I've been doing this for 15 years. Like yeah. maybe it's time to take a sabbatical or something. Mm -hmm. But then something always pulls me back that yeah. strikes my interest and, and I keep going. And uh, so I think, I think you need that. It can't be about the money. Right. It can't be about... Um, in my mind, it's it's. I don't work like I don't like the idea of having a far off goal and making that the thing that I'm, I'm striving for. Right. I think I have to be motivated by things I'm doing today, right. personally. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to stay motivated that way. And it's just like making stuff and working with great people and being surprised by the things that people make who, who we work with. And yeah. lately, it's been about seeing people grow. I, I really enjoy um, seeing people in the company grow who've been with us. One of our programmers just had his eight year anniversary at the company wow. and like just remembering when I when I first hired him, how much he's grown, how much how far he's come. It's just a it's a fun thing to be able to do that when you have people that stick with you for a long period of time. Yeah. So we're very big into into that as well. So how, how big is your team now? We have forty one people in the wow. company. Yeah. I didn't realize it was that big now. Yeah, it's big, relatively no, big. I mean, yeah, yeah for I, mean, us. I remember watching like yeah. before when you had like It's a few you know, a few people here. Right. And like, yeah. you know, we've been around for fifteen years. Yeah. So uh, we could be significantly larger. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to be significantly larger, but but we could. Mm -hmm. But we, we we work really hard not to hire people. Yeah. No, I yeah. saw. I think. <laughs> and you have to because yeah. there's you have it's, more ambitions than you than you can do you know than you can handle. And so right. and you probably find great people everywhere. Like there's great people. It's hard, harder and harder to find great people because right. there's so many great companies these mm -hmm. days. But you 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 know you always want to do more, and then mm -hmm. you know it's so easy to be like let's just hire more people to do more yeah. things. But that's when you get caught. And, and then the quality starts to suffer, and, and that's just not great. I think that's the first talk that I saw, the first time I saw you, was at a talk where you literally were talking about doing less. Yeah, and in fact, we've, we've, we've done too much. And like 2004 for us yeah. is actually going to be a year of focus, and I can't talk about it right now. Right. But there's some things that are going to be announced next year, which mm -hmm. are really about getting back to the basics of what we're all about. Interesting, so. interesting. All right, so let's talk about your journey. And you've done Bootstrap for quite some time. I'd say yes. you're... From day right. one, right? Yeah. So how long you bootstrap for up until two thousand six? I think. Well, we've always been bootstrapped. Yeah. I mean, we took we took an investment from uh, from Jeff Bezos in two thousand six. Yeah. Yeah. That's our only investment. Our right. only investor right. did it once. Yeah. It was money off the table for me and David, my business partner. Right. It was money for the business. So we've always been funded by our customers from right. day one and continue to be today. And that's how I, I believe in running the business. Okay. So let's talk about bootstrapping. Um, you're obviously a strong advocate for that. Yeah. Um. What are some, you know, obviously personal experiences, like why, first of all, why? Why? Yeah. 
Um, fundamental, fundamental reason why is because um, I think it's about the lessons you want to learn so, and the things you have to get better at. So if you're an entrepreneur uh, and you're building a business, you're, you're eventually going to have to learn how to make money. Right, so you have to practice that. Just like you have to practice, if you want to be a really good guitarist, you got to pick up a guitar and practice playing guitar. Mm -hmm. The idea that you can just like turn on the the money lever one day and be good at making money is just it's not true. Just like you can't pick up a guitar and be a virtuoso unless you just happen to be one of those rare people, right? right. So you got to practice. And if you have a lot of money in the bank and you have investors up front and you have all this cushion, mm -hmm. um, you don't have to practice making money. What you end up doing is practicing spending money. And I think practicing spending money is the wrong thing to practice. I think you need to practice how to make money, and so you need to you need to struggle. You need to have those op those those moments where you know you just need to find something that you can sell mm -hmm. and learn how to sell, learn how to how to make something that's worth paying for. I think those are the lessons, and that's the that's the right direction that you should be taking early on. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you do have something that's very successful or moderately successful, and um, you feel like you want to take it to another level or whatever people say. You can, you know, then just um, get some money, maybe, if you yeah. need to. So have you I ever still, had that? I'm like, still not a big fan of that. But I mean, have you ever had that, like, harsh reality, like, oh, gosh, like, I've got to, you know, I'm discouraged, I've hit a wall, like, got yeah. to raise some money? I, mean, I had it a lot before we became successful. I mean, everyone, right. like, the thing is, is you, people like to look at companies and go, oh, they've never had to struggle, but of course you do. Right. We had to get our first customer. We had to get our, before we did products, we had to get our first web design client. Right. We had to get paid by that mm -hmm. client, you know. People stiff you all the time. Like you have all those struggles. It's right. been a while since I've had those struggles, but right. I remember having those struggles distinctly. Yeah. Um, and it just teaches you the important lessons. Mm -hmm. I don't think um, I don't think you're going to be a good business person. Typically, um, if you don't have that struggle in your background, I think it's really right. important to have. I can see how someone who's 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 had that struggle and they want to start something new and they go raise a bunch of money because they want to go big this time or whatever yeah. they want to do. I get it, but yeah. I think it's very important for every entrepreneur to to struggle through making their own money. It's a very important lesson. Definitely. Okay. Um, so in bootstrapping, I mean, you are likely cash strapped to begin with. Yeah. Um, how would you go about like you know celebrating, keeping the motivation up, like celebrating those victories internally and keeping the motivation going when you are bootstrapping, so you can't like go out. You yeah, know, you're not going to go get a table somewhere. And no, you don't go crazy. Well, the best way to, to do that is to is to give people their paychecks. Right. You're like, <laughs> you get paid this week because we mm -hmm. sold these things that you right. made, and um, this money that you're getting mm -hmm. is because of your hard work, not because someone gave us a bunch of money to give to you. Right. So I think that's that's the best way to motivate people. Um, is 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 show them what their work is is resulting in, mm -hmm. and also of course, you know. People have to be, again, intrinsically motivated to do great work. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important, especially early on, to celebrate every sale, yeah. every customer's name, every customer's location, mm -hmm. um, you know, as much data as you can share with the rest of your company. But let people know that this stuff is, is working. A lot of companies will have like a like a cash register sound, you know, tied mm -hmm. to their ordering system mm -hmm. or something. And that, those little things really matter because it's yeah. like people are working hard and then they know their hard work is paying off. Mm -hmm. And um, that helps. That helps a lot more than a party. Like a party once fades away, but hearing that cash register every day, getting your paycheck every day. You want day, to make that happen. You want to make that happen, exactly. So it's yeah. like small things like that. Yeah. It's funny yeah. how those little things like motivate. They totally do. They yeah. totally do. Um, in fact, like whenever we launch a new feature, we t even today, um, we, we pipe in data about sales. For the, so for example, a couple days ago, we launched a new feature in Basecamp. Mm -hmm. Where people can buy storage a la carte. It used mm -hmm. to be that you had to upgrade to a whole new plan. Now you can just buy 10 gigs of extra space, right? Mm -hmm. um, not a huge like revolution, obviously, but we didn't have this for a while. So we launched it, and then every time someone buys storage, yep. it pipes in into our campfire room um, the amount of storage they bought, mm -hmm. um, the total amount of storage sold, and the total amount of money made from selling storage so far. And we'll probably do that for the next month. And it's a great it's a great way to get everyone fired up about the fact that we made this thing, we launched it out in the world, and it's working. People are buying it, um, and it's also a good reminder to us that like people are using this feature. Yeah. So we don't. It's not only with dollars; we do it with other things too. Like um, uh, if there's if there's a new feature where, where you know people create something, we might pipe it and say twenty of these were created today or something like that, so that's people great. know. No, it's very important to have that important. feedback loop. And we're going to talk about that in a minute because of the remote work okay. situation. Yeah, yeah, so we'll sure. Talk more about that, but. You just mentioned something that was kind of interesting and reminded me that Basecamp was like one of the first like cloud products, and that was, was scary. 
Like I'm serious. Yeah. Like that's really yes. scary. I'm gonna give my data yes. to this company that's kind of a startup yes. in Chicago. And I, I personally had that struggle working at a big company at the time. Yeah. I was trying to get them to use Basecamp. Yeah. Whoa. It's scary. It's gotta be in behind our firewall. Totally. It, and and, and we, lot, we still but, get that, but yeah. it's like almost never now. Right. Although we're getting it more now with all the weird security privacy yeah, NSA stuff that's going on and stuff. And yeah, two two factor verification because you know hackers have gotten well not hackers but crackers, crackers have gotten really <laughs> really good because hackers are programmers but like right. people who try and crack and get in and stuff mm -hmm. those those people are, are out there and it's getting more and more sophisticated. Yeah. But um, uh, the the thing is that was actually interesting too is when we launched Basecamp we were still a web design company. Right. We were asking other web design companies to use our product mm -hmm. with their clients and people were afraid not just of the cloud thing yeah. but they're afraid of like. I don't want to give 37 signals oh, my, my client data. lists yeah, yeah. or like my they they'll see my client work right. and you have all that time to look at it right exactly. Yeah, exactly and of course we would never want to look at anyone's data but right. that was another fear that people had early exactly. on yeah. so there's always fears um, and you just have to to weather them I've always felt like it's not my job to educate people mm -hmm. on their decisions um, you know you you put the product out there you you say everything you can that's real to make people trust you and if they don't that's fine mm -hmm. and uh, that happens and you know it's just to go chase a particular customer and try and make them change their, like, eliminate their fear, it's very difficult to do because that's a right. human emotion and it's very hard to hear someone's human emotion. Yeah. So I just or try and stay it. away from that or yeah. change it. Yeah. Totally. All right. We're going to pause for one second. If you have uh, a phone, mobile phone, you can tweet questions. We're gonna a recorded get phone would work too. A recorded phone could work. <laughs> could call it in, I guess, or just use your voice. Um, but yeah, the, the hashtag is TechHoxelChai, C H I. And we'll look through those. You can tweet it at myself or Jason. We'll we'll find those as long as you use the hashtag and pull those up in a little bit. I um, want to get it queued up so that you know I'm not waiting for questions. Yeah, cool. All right, so um, we, we're going to talk about remote, but mm -hmm. um, before we do that, because it, it is, you have a new book. And it's we have a new book called Remote. Called you know, Remote. Um, it's for sale. You can for, buy it, <laughs> which is nice. I'll sign it. I'll sign it. Um, there was more thing I want to talk about with that cloud situation, but I guess we'll come back to it. My uh, brain went towards Twitter, apparently. For okay, that's All fine. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about remote. Um, you, this is your what number book? Third? Technically third, yeah. third, four, actually technically fourth book, but second major book on a with a major publisher. We self published one before that called yeah. Getting Real. Did really well. It did really well, and then the first book we ever did was when we were a web design company called Defensive Design for the Web. Oh, I remember which that. Which was yep. I don't know two thousand two something like that. Right, I think. Yeah. But and you published that one yourself too? No, that was with a publisher called New Writers. They do oh. like all the web design books. Right, got yeah. it. Okay, but that let's okay. So let's talk about the first book you published yourself because that was pretty great. Getting right? real. Right. Yeah. So that was. I mean, you put out I PDF. Think, PDF. Twenty bucks. Right. Sold like a million dollars worth. Over a million dollars worth wow. of, of PDFs. And um, that was in like two thousand six. Two thousand six. We yeah. we put up there and then Steel we did. Steel trap up here. Very good. Yeah. And then we did a a, a paperback yeah. using Lulu. Mm -hmm. You know, like for mm -hmm. on demand printing. Yeah. Um, and now we give it away for free, so we're kind of like we, we're we're milking it. But I, to right. be honest, I think it's the best book we've ever written. It's really good. Yeah, it's it's the best. It's the it's the truest, most realistic book in terms of how what it takes to really run a software company. Say that you have a book for sale. That's a different book. Okay. That's a different topic. Okay. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I do think <laughs> that getting real is is an important book for us because yeah. it really set the tone of the type of writing we want to do and how we want to write it. Mm -hmm. um, and then since then we've done rework. And, and that rework. reminds me of what I was going to ask you before. Okay. How did you build? You have an army of people that follow you guys. How did you do that? It takes time. Yeah. And you have to have a point of view. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have an opinion, and you have to be uh, ruthless in sharing it. Basically, you you can't you can't be in the middle. No one's following anybody in the middle. You mm -hmm. you have to have something to say, and and that doesn't doesn't mean you want to say things that are controversial for the sake of controversy right. controversy but mm -hmm. if you have an opinion that's that's original or unique or whatever it might be or even if it's not but you have a different mm -hmm. way of saying it you got to say it and then people will notice eventually mm -hmm. and you just keep doing it and you keep doing it and you keep doing it you started it. that before there was it, things were super high today it's easy to do right back then back then how did you do it so back then we we, we launched our blog in like uh, 2000 i think it was or 1999 yeah. Yeah. i'm not sure exactly wow. now but um we wrote about things that we cared about. So we wrote right. about web design, we wrote yeah. about design, we wrote about um, mm -hmm. also like industrial design, things that we liked, that we saw, products that we liked and we saw. Right. Wrote about the industry, wrote about collecting money from clients, wrote about what you do when a client doesn't pay. Like wrote about these things that we were doing every day. These mm -hmm. were things that we were discussing internally every day. Right. And we said, why should, why not just discuss this openly? I remember having mm -hmm. this conversation like where we talk about, we could fill a book every three days with the amount of things we talk about inside the company. Mm -hmm. Why not just talk about it with everybody else too? Right. 
So we, we put a blog out there, or whatever it was called at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, was that scary, though? Because like, that's kind of a new idea back then. Uh, I didn't have any expectations, so it wasn't scary. Okay. It wasn't like, this is a big deal. It's just like, let's just do it and see mm -hmm. what happens. Mm -hmm. And we kept doing it and kept finding that we had things to say. And so, you know, over time, people just hear about it and start following you. And mm -hmm. then RSS comes out and like people start subscribing to your, your feed. And, right. and before you know it, you've got 1,000 people following you. And then you've got 2,000. Mm -hmm. And then it gets exponentially large. Mm -hmm. And like, there's over 100,000 people a day that read Signal versus Noise today. Right. And, and the blog, which is the blog right. we have. Yeah. And what's great about that is that now we have this audience, right. and now we can announce things to the audience. And so we don't have to spend money reaching the audience anymore. They're coming to us right. because we paid them basically to come to us by giving them, by sharing everything we know about what we do for years and years and years. And they you think it's a fair forward, trade. Basically. Yeah. You shared all this information. We're big into that because yeah. we, we don't we don't spend any money on marketing. We don't have a marketing department. We don't have an advertising department. Mm -hmm. We don't do any advertising. Mm -hmm. um, it's all word of mouth, all sharing, all getting the word out that way. And so the best way we found out to do that is to, is to give give as much as we can of ourselves mm -hmm. to other entrepreneurs and designers who might have something that they could learn from what we've learned. Right. All right. So that brings me back to the book, the yep. latest book. Yes. We went kind of this way. We, we got back. Good. We're, back. We're here. Remote. Okay. We're here. So um, let's talk about remote. So what was the inspiration for remote? And I, I already know the answer, but you can tell us. That's fine. So we have 40 <laughs> some odd people in the company. and. Um, 13 of those people are here in Chicago, mm -hmm. actually 14 now, and the rest of the company is spread out across 25 different cities around the world. So oh. we're a very, we're a hybrid company that we yeah. have a headquarters, but we also have people working all over the, all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've learned a lot about how to build a company with remote workers yeah. uh, and the advantages of it and the disadvantages of it and how to make it work. And just like everything that we share, we share based on our own experience. And we had enough experience over the past 10 years of learning how to do this um, that it was filed away in our brains. And then a lot of people have been asking us, how do you do this? How do you have a remote company? How do you know people are getting the work done? Like all these questions people have. And when you get a lot of questions, you eventually get annoyed about answering them when they're all the same. Mm -hmm. So you're like, let's put these into a book yeah. and then sell those answers. Right. Um, and and <laughs> like so that's this. what we do. Yeah. Um, and so that's what the book's about. It's everything we know about how to run a remote company. And it's mm -hmm. from two perspectives. It's from the employee who wants to do this, mm -hmm. and it's from the employer who wants to try this. So it's kind of we're trying to hit both audiences there. And it, in the book, you focus a lot on uh, you know your output is results, right? Instead of it's the work. The, right. the work is what you can look at. You don't have the social component. Well, you do have the social component, but it's not as, as strong. Um, mm -hmm. There's no office politics. There's all that stuff's kind of gone. It just fades away. And what you have to look at and evaluate is the work, which is what it's all about at the end of the day anyway. So right. it's a great way to really get to the truth. So how do you decide that you can do this? Like what's, like if, I was, if company's like, oh, I don't know. Gotta... If company wants to try it? Yeah. You got to start really small. And But the, the yeah. key is, is you don't, you don't want to pick out a small group of people and experiment with a small group right. of people. You want to yeah. offer it up to everybody. So let's say you've got a company of 20 people and you want to just try it. Mm -hmm. You say, okay, hey, everybody, we're going to try this. We're going to try this experiment. Mm -hmm. um, let's say the first Thursday of every month, Everyone is free, if they want, to work from home. That's it. Yeah. And just see what happens. And what you'll find is that the, the, the world doesn't end, and the company doesn't go out of business, and like shit still works. That's and in fact, Thursday. <laughs> yeah, people come back on Friday, and they're like, wow, I got a lot of stuff done. That was yeah. really fun. Like, Let's do it again. So you do it again. And then maybe you do it two days a month. And then maybe you do it every other day yeah. for two weeks. And you just keep like trying it and see where the balance is. Because it's not, everyone has a different balance. It's mm -hmm. not like, Every company can work the way we work. And there's some yeah. companies like Automatic who make WordPress. They're yeah. completely remote. Yeah. 200 some odd people. They don't have email. They, they don't even use email. Right. Right. They don't use email. Right. They have their own tool. Right. And completely remote, 200 some odd people around all over the place. Yeah. So there's ex extremes there. There's hybrid situations. You got to find out where you are. But start small. Offer it up to everyone. Do one day a month and just see what happens. Yeah. And and you'll you'll find that it works. It yeah. works, period. I mean, it's there's some growing pains here and there and some stuff you got to learn, but it works. And it's worth it. So... I see, obviously, the first thing I think about is communication, and you guys build communication tools, right? Like tools that you can use for this. Yes. Um, are there any tips, like though, that you know, like how do you see like people getting resentful or frustrated, or you know, how do you deal with all? Yeah. That? One thing you have to do is you have to have a central place where everyone can talk. So it can be Basecamp, it could be Campfire, it could be one of right. a dozen other tools. I'm not pimping our products right. like it could be anything there's yeah. lots of stuff out there for this mm -hmm. and we use things like skype and google hangouts and all yeah. these other tools too right yep. um, you got to have places where all the conversations happen yep. you can't have a place where like the local conversations happen mm -hmm. and then everyone else is like somewhere else and they have their own conversations they're in their own style like you have even if 
you and I were working together, yeah. we would still be talking over Basecamp or over IM or right. over uh, Campfire or over Skype. Yep. Occasionally, of course, we're going to talk because we're nearby, but yeah. most of the business, most of the work has to happen in a in a sort of a, a safe, universal place somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's, that's how you establish a... Uh, a fair culture, mm -hmm. um, and you don't have two cultures. You don't have the, the local culture and the remote culture. Um, so you need to have that. And then the thing is, is that a lot of people say, "Well, how do you do? You know, how do you get to know people and all that stuff?" Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's kind of amazing because we've had a lot of people who work for us who used to work at big companies, yeah. and they worked around their coworkers all day long. Mm -hmm. and they come to work for us, and in like a week or two, they know their coworkers better at Thirty Seven Signals, even though they never met them personally, mm -hmm. because of, um, of of the chats, right, chat rooms. talking constantly. Constant talking, and we also set up different rooms for different things. So we have a room called All Pets, where everyone who has a pet at the company can go in there and share cat photos and whatever. We have we have a room for comic book lovers because we have a handful of those at the company. We have a, a room for film buffs and music buffs, and mm -hmm. and so we have all these different rooms. And you know, all day long, people are talking about film, but they're getting their work done too. So right. that's totally fine. Yeah. And they're they're building these bonds that they normally wouldn't have had if they all had worked together. Right. And then they're not bothering people who don't care about film because a lot of people don't care about film. <laughs> And we have film nerds, like you don't want to bother the people with, with film and stuff. So yeah. you just create these spaces where people can talk mm -hmm. and, and you recognize that people are going to talk. So let's give them a space to do it. and They'll talk more mm -hmm. and they'll get to know each other really well. And it just, it works. You don't need to be physically in one place to get to know somebody. So you have a really nice space though here. We do. We, 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 we have a nice office. Yeah. But we, we built this office 10 years after we got the business. Right. So yeah. it's, it was a luxury spend for us. It was right. not a requirement. Right. Before that, we had been subletting space from other companies and bouncing back and that's forth right. between office spaces. And we finally decided after 10 years. I think that's about the good time. To let's do it. Let's do our own thing. Let's do our, <laughs> Let's build our own place yeah. um, where we're safe enough that we can invest the money to do that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, it's great. I love it. It's a great space, but it's it's not required. You know, right. It's an optional thing. And you're, but you're seeing a trend of, you know, in Silicon Valley or other places, building these office culture focused company spaces. Yeah. Um, Very and, elaborate and offices. And you're saying, Let's go re remote work. You know, well, remote. what I don't like about some of these super elaborate offices yeah. is that they're built to trap people at the office mm -hmm. to stay there and want to work longer mm -hmm. and longer and longer. Mm -hmm. And that to me is, is wrong. Yeah. Um, because people will burn out and you'll lose great people. And that's so, so how do you be. feel about like, like Melissa Mayer, for example, Yahoo? Pulling everyone back in? Yeah. Um, time will tell how that pans out. I mean, I don't think Yahoo's problems were tied to the 3% of remote workers mm -hmm. that they had. Like, <laughs> the problem is they've had five CEOs in five years, and they've lost their way, and they're doing a million right. different things. Like, that's their problem. Yeah. It's not because 3% of the people work mm -hmm. at home. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I don't think she meant it that way. No, no, but no. the press sort of took it that way. Right. Look, it's her company. Yeah. She's incredibly, yeah. incredibly, like, she, she's done some amazing things at, at Google. Yeah. Um, very well qualified. Let's see what, what happens. Mm -hmm. um, she definitely deserves the benefit of the doubt. But um, I don't personally like the message it sends by saying the only way we can all be together mm -hmm. is if we're physically together. Because right. let's face it, you cannot have 13,000 people <laughs> physically together <Every> day. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. It's all about small teams right. and it's about communication and mm -hmm. you can do all this stuff remotely. And look, if you need to bring, like a few weeks ago, I, I flew a designer in for two days. It cost like 600 bucks. Like it's not a big deal to bring someone in town yeah. if you need to. Mm -hmm. to, to sit down and have a really high bandwidth conversation, then they go back and they do the work and, yeah. and, and I do my work. Now, yeah, now I think about it even more. But th that said, like, yeah, I've never run a company like Yahoo, yeah. obviously. It's a very different world. It's a passion and, and, problem, I think, of getting people passionate together versus... Yeah, it, but, but see, yeah, okay. I just don't think that people are passionate about being around 13,000 other people. No, people no, are no. passionate <laughs> about the work that they're doing yeah. and making sure the work is meaningful work. Mm -hmm. And they work closely with a small group of people who they really like. Yeah. And that can be done anywhere. But again, let's let's see what happens. Yeah. It yeah. does seem to be like the weird this weird thing like HP's doing just did it now mm -hmm. and they're in deep trouble. Yahoo is in deep trouble. Right. Best Buy is sort of in trouble and they pull they used to have a lot of remote workers are pulling yeah. them back. So we'll see if it's a trend of like it's a it's a flag. Mm -hmm. Companies that are dying wave this flag. Like, oh, we no. all need to be together now, but that's <laughs> no, not the problem. No, no, no. I hope no. that. That's yeah. That's, that's not the problem. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. I was thinking, yeah, okay, we'll get to the next topic. So do you think startups should do it? All startups should work work remotely? Uh, I think I don't think this is about what you have to do. I think right. it's about an option. Yeah. The thing the thing that I think is good about it, from an employer's point of view, mm -hmm. is that I have access to the best people in the world this way. Mm -hmm. We have one of the best pro one of the best programmers on our team lives in Idaho. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, our best designers lives in Oklahoma City. Yep. You know, um, people like I would never have access to those people if I said thirty mile radius. That's the only that's way it. we hire. Is we got to be around here. Mm -hmm. 
and it, for me, like as a company owner, I want like I need to have great people. Right. And so why would I limit myself to just who I can see? It just doesn't make sense to me. Right. And as an employee, it sucks to have your whole life tied like your 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 life tied to a physical place because your employer says you have to live in this one place. Like for example, we have a couple people who work on farms. Mm -hmm. They live in a farm because yeah. they want to have 10, 20 acres. Like that's what they want to do in life. Mm -hmm. Um and why why should I tell them they can't do that? Right. And why should they not have opportunities to have a great job? Mm -hmm. I don't understand that yeah. at all. So it seems to start some resentment. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, and then we have employees who used to yeah. live in Chicago, yeah. like one of Kristen, who runs our support team, she yeah. lived in Chicago for a while, and she moved to, to uh, uh, Portland, right. and she didn't lose her job. She can move to Portland, right. and like that's awesome, and mm -hmm. she loves that, and we love it. She right. does great work. We don't lose the employee. Yeah. She doesn't lose her job. Like how perfect is that? So th that to me is it's it's the it's the it's the it's the right way to treat people more mm -hmm. so than it is like about even about business. Right. So on that same note, do you, is there something you do like as with those 41 employees to make sure that certain time zones you stick to or does it matter? That's, that's yeah, the difficult part. That is tough. I mean, yeah. it's tough, if, for example, and this happens a lot. People will outsource stuff to India, for example. Oh, that's a hard one. And the pro there's a lot of problems with it, yeah. but one of the problems is, is that they're like 12 hours apart. That's the and so there's like no overlap. So right. feedback cycles are incredibly slow yeah. and it's you can't work that way. No, it's hard. So we, we always think it's good to have at least three, four hours of overlap with the people you're working with. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean everybody in the company has to be three or four hours apart, but like right. your team, or what if you assemble a team of people, you should make sure there's enough overlap during the day. Mm -hmm. What you'll actually find is that because you only have a certain amount of overlap, you actually, people actually get more stuff done mm -hmm. because they don't bother each other as much. Right. Um, they, they bother each other for three hours, and then for the next four or five hours right. or whatever it is, like they can actually work in isolation. You know, I don't mean like being isolated, no. but they can work well, without interruption and, yeah. and focus and get more work done. And I remember hearing you say before, you know, you're not a big person on meetings, so that's mm -hmm. not really a thing, so it doesn't really matter. But yeah, so you, it's more like a collaborative, collaborative environment all the time. Versus it's we're always like, yeah. we're always talking, so you don't have to have meetings. We're right. always communicating, so you don't have to have meetings. We're always right. working together. So you don't, I mean, we have an occasional meeting, like right. occasionally. Yeah, but it's always the last resort, mm -hmm. and it's it's always based on like something you just can't do remotely. Maybe it's right. like let's just sit around and draw something. Although you can start to do that remotely too now, right. but it's some, sometimes nice to do that. Um, but it's always an, it's it's a last resort. It's not the first tool we ever go to. Okay. So one more thought on remote. Uh, yeah. Is there anything or any insights or chapters that you didn't include that you wanted to that you just didn't quite make it or you want to share? Yeah, uh, people have been asking us about about something that we didn't include in the book, and, and we should have. And I don't really have a lot of great thoughts on it. But mm -hmm. um, what about mentoring people remotely? Mm -hmm. um, you have a young employee who comes in, yep. maybe their first job out of college or something. Yep. You know, if they're stuck. Four thousand miles away. Like, how do you how do you mentor them? How do you help them yeah. improve? And that that's hard. It is definitely a harder challenge. Um, yeah. and I don't think we've nailed it yet. Mm -hmm. One of the things though that we've decided to do is whenever we have a new employee, they get basically a buddy for ninety days, oh. and that buddy could be anyone in the company. It doesn't just have to be the same role. Yeah. But they're they're sort of they're the buddy, so they they can help them with you know all the stuff that that mm -hmm. you know, getting them up to speed on the company and the yeah. culture and just like how things run and. Yep. And by having that one point of contact, it's not like an HR person, but right. like just one of their fellow yeah. coworkers yeah. who's doing the work that they're doing. Um, it really helps a lot. So that's a great way to at least get people up to speed. But mentoring, I don't know. I don't know how well that works, to be honest. So yeah. um, it may not be the best idea to have people without a lot of self structure. Mm -hmm. You know, fresh, fresh out of school. Um, maybe not. They don't really. They aren't organized enough yet to know how to run their own lives right. in that way. Like not self starters. Right. Yeah, maybe maybe not the right combination for them. So maybe there are more people you should have locally, right? Or or bring them in for a while and yeah. then 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 let them go out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, uh, let's talk about Chicago. Chicago, Chicago. Yeah. Um, so you you know, is there one start? So you're you're focused on startups. Do you invest in startups? I don't. I've never put any money into a private company, except uh, Starter League. But that's the that's I was going to talk about. Thirty Seven Signals did that. Right. Me personally, no, I have not. Okay. Yeah. Do you keep track though, like things that are happening? Uh, yeah, I pay attention. Okay. Is there one that you know, one startup that's you know of that just comes to mind? You're like this one's going to be big in 2014. Start uh, well, um, something that just launched. I mean, like I remember looking at at, at Uber like when mm -hmm. that launched, mm -hmm. and like I'm a customer, and like this yeah. thing is just going to yeah. blow up. Yeah. Same thing with Airbnb. Like mm -hmm. Chicago these, these, focused. Anything Chicago focused? Um, uh, I, I'm a huge Grubhub customer. I yeah. eat out way too much, or eat in way too much. Actually, mm -hmm. um, I love I love what they're up to. Yeah. Um, 
I love using their service. They've got great personality in their product, mm -hmm. which is something I'm a big fan of. Um, it's fun to use the thing. It works really well. It's getting better. Yeah. And I keep using it. So I'm a big, I mean, they're not a startup anymore. anymore yeah. But Chicago-based company, I think that they're yeah. they're doing awesome work. Yeah. And they've yeah. been at it for a while. I mean, they have. They've been iterating and making the product better, yeah. and I see it all the time. Yeah. Although, if anyone here is from is from Grubhub, anyone here from Grubhub? Okay. So they, they've eliminated, they're killing this thing called Yummy Rummy, oh, which really? is like the best. That's the best thing. Yes. Yeah. Oh. They're killing it. Maybe they'll bring it back, but they're killing it. And that, it's funny because like that bummed me out. Mm -hmm. That that was like the first thing they've ever done that bummed me out. Mm -hmm. And it's like what so I can win a free drink, which I never do. But like, <laughs> just the, the it was playful. Yeah. And, and that to me represents what they're about. No, maybe they're going to replace it with like a new something. game. So yeah. maybe that, we'll have to wait and see. But that kind of bummed me out a bit. Okay. Um. So what do you think? Just in general, you've been part of the scene for a while. What do you What do you feel like uh, has been going on lately? What, what, what in Chicago? Like? Yeah. Well, I mean this. It, it's, Huge amount. Yeah. Um, this place obviously mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the big change. Mm -hmm. I think here, um, and uh, I, you know, I think it's an experiment. Mm -hmm. I think um, it'll take time to see how it all pans out. Mm -hmm. um, but I love that it's happening, uh, and there seems to be a lot of energy and, and, and excitement around here. I think we need to see a few companies graduate yeah. from here that um, have a big impact or have built meaningful companies. Um, so I think it's too early. It's only right. been around for like what, a year or something, yeah. two years. Um, so it'll, it'll take some time for that to happen, but I think that has to happen. Um, something I'm really excited about, Howard Tillman, Tillman who's the new CEO, mm -hmm. um, one of the things he said is like, this is not a place to play entrepreneur. Right. This is not a place to, to, to pretend. This is a place where you, you build something and you move on. Mm -hmm. And we have to be about getting people in and up yeah. and out. And I love that mentality. Um, and I hope that he, he, really, um, he really makes that happen here. That was actually my that needs question. to happen. What, what do you, where do you see that? What are the challenges? What, what do you feel, how do you feel well, the challenge is, I mean, just like anything, you, you got to make money. Companies have to make money, and yeah. like this, this, this whole tech world is not focused on that, unfortunately. And I think it's a dangerous, dangerous thing. So, yeah. I would love to see. So, I don't want to see Chicago try and be San Francisco or right. try and be New York or yeah. whatever. That's a mistake. It will never happen, mm -hmm. and there's no reason to try and be something you're not. Right. Um, I think Chicago could be a great place for building. Bootstrapped companies, long-term companies, mm -hmm. companies that are focused on, on, on selling stuff, on, 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 on revenues and profits, yep. um, being around for the long term. I think that represents the city of big shoulders. It represents the hardworking Midwest. The, yep. the whole, the whole you know, ethos here um, is, to me, embodied by that point of view. Mm -hmm. And so I'd love to see more of that and less um, trying to like blow things up fast and, and all right. that kind of stuff. Yeah. I just... I, it, it bugs me when, when anything and anybody tries to be something they're not. And right. I think a city specifically should never try and be something it's not because it just won't happen. Right. Um, so, okay. anyway. I think, I think on that note, we can open up the audience. Yeah, let's do it. I, I'm okay. excited. All right. So, we're going to do both Roving Mike and via Twitter. So, I'm going to first let's kick it off with Roving Mike. Where is my mic? Jen, are you going to take the mic? This is Jen Kinsava, our COO, right here. Let's hear it for Jen. <laughs> Okay, so who's got the, you got the first question? Why don't you just shout it out? And we'll repeat. He's right it. here. Yeah. Yeah, we talked. And each time he was freaking cracking me up. Come on. You know, here, yeah, no, because it's, it's not that. No, we're not too frank. Yeah, all right. I'm frank too. All right, so first thing, first part of that is uh, yeah. first time I met you, the lesson learned was a unique algorithm. Success is about aligning your talents with your purpose in that way that creates both fulfillment and abundance. That's right. I love that. Because then I learned that first time I met you, that nobody could help me. I had to be able to do it. And I had to figure out what it is that I wasn't articulating, you know, that I intuitively knew, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. that held me back. I was too busy trying to become that, which I wanted to be, versus claim that. Okay. So I love that. I love the whole thing about my way. That was the first tech thing. Okay. The second time I met you, you came in with a curveball. You came with a bucket list before we met. So you came in with this idea of unique harmonization. So you, so it was like this. You started to say the company, believe it or not, is not a full freaking fracking company. Instead, the company is a manifestation of all its different parts working together. So we really don't know what we plan. But what we see is the result of really enabling these small different pockets of community 
Okay. That was marvelous. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now today I learned a new, new thing about trust. All the time I believed that trust was about getting to know people and really creating these established bonds. But today I realized again, you know, what you learn to do is you learn to instead of market hack trust. And how do you really hack trust? Because first you got to realize there's no such thing as trust. Is that the and, question? You know, how do you hack uh, trust? I'm not sure. You know, in other words, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. putting prep, okay. and, I'll, yeah, yeah. and I'll wrap it up. Yeah. So in other words, the thing is, is that what you do is you teach people, and the only reason I'm iterating is because as I'm learning and I'm hoping as I share it, others will be able to and they can take it from me. Yeah. Um. So the 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 second, the, well, the third lesson we just learned today is that what people learn to trust is what they learn to do. So if you work on developing each and every skill, what it is, you don't have to worry about trusting the market, trusting forecasting. What you do is you trust what you do. And that eliminates a lot of fear. That's what I got. Now, yeah. here's the question, okay, now yeah. that I've done that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Bring it home. All right. Now, the question is this. Everything you've been talking about and everything I've been reading and following up online regarding 37 Secrets has been really great. But as each with each meeting, I'm seeing that you went from introvert to, you know, more open, a more powerful speaker and getting ready to really engage. What is it that we can really expect to come out of? your next stage of development? What can we expect as your fans and your friends and people that really love you that's going to come directly from Jason Freeman? Mm, my gosh, that's a big question. <laughs> I hope, um, I, 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 uh, I want to be, I want to be a better leader. Um, what I've, what I've realized is that, um, uh, I, I've, I used to get involved with things a little bit too much. And um, I want to step back and ask more questions and have other people figure out the answers and sort of help people get better that way rather than like say, you'll be better if you do it like this or better if you do it like that. But I'd rather say like, why do you think you're doing it like this? And are there any other ways you can do things? So I, I would just like to, to, to lead through questions more than statements. So that's, that's personally my challenge moving forward is, is, to, is, to, be, is, to, is to ask questions back rather than say, do this or do that. And that, that's, that's tough because I, I, I'm, I'm a designer, not by trade, because I didn't go to school for this, but like that's what I've been doing for a long time. When you're a designer, it's very, you get very picky, and, and you spot all these things, like that's a little bit off, and the proportions aren't right, and then, you know, all this stuff. And that, that's like nitpicky. And, and then you can carry that into the other things that you do, and that's, that's kind of dangerous. So anyway, I just want to like ask questions more than, than, than make statements. Okay. We'll see. All right, I'm going to take the next one from Twitter. Okay. Um, is it behind us? I, it is. I just don't know if it's showing up. Okay. Me right there, I, I pulled it from my phone. So, yep. Um, so, Jason, uh, you said success uh, didn't come overnight. Uh, what are some things you did to promote it? Well, so um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of the idea of longevity and just sticking it out. And a funny thing happens. Um, if you manage to stick around, uh, you kind of get successful because like if you if you <laughs> can't standing. stick it out then you're not successful because right. like if you can't stick it out you go out of business and so, so right. if you can figure out if, if you can figure out like I want to keep doing this right. thing um, I want to keep making stuff I want to keep working with great people mm-hmm. and and um, I want to keep doing this for 20 or 30 or 40 years like mm-hmm. I have a very long term time horizon I'd love mm-hmm. to you know have this company for my whole life mm-hmm. um, you inevitably just become successful because if if you have a short time horizon, if you're like, I want to build this thing in three years and blow it up and get bought out or whatever and do something new, um, you keep jumping from thing to thing and you're starting over all the time. And starting over all the time is very hard to be successful when you're starting over all the time. But if you keep pouring yourself into something, mm-hmm. you get better and better and better and better and better at it. It's about practice. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like like I said, like if you want to learn how to be a great musician or play the piano or something, right. you're not going to be that good. When you you can suck when you start. Mm-hmm. In a year, you're going to be better. Two years better, three years better, four years better. Now, if you stop there and then switch to a new instrument, yeah. you're going to suck again. You're going right. to suck at trumpet this time, and you're going to have to get better. Um, but if you keep playing piano for 15 years, you're going to be fucking good at it. You're right. And yeah. that's that's what it comes down to. So I think that if you can, fi- and the only way to do that mm-hmm. is to control your own destiny by not having someone behind you, which is pu- who's pushing you out of the business, like an investor might do, because mm-hmm. they want the return back, which I understand, because that's what investors do. I get that. That's their business. Right. Um, but also, you got to figure out how to make money um, from your customers, and so then they're they're paying for you to continue to do what you do. Right. That makes so sense. I mean, it's it's you just got to have this. I'm in it. Don't give you got to feel like you're in yeah. it. I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs who are like, 
my next thing is going to be. It's like, what the fuck are you doing now, then? Why are you thinking about your next thing? Yeah, why are you even doing What is that about? So I, you just got to stop thinking about your next thing and think about what you're doing now. And if you're not doing what you're, if you don't like what you're doing now, you got to do something else. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Um, great advice for a lot of, I mean, you definitely you see a lot of startups. And yeah, I mean. that a lot. Like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. If this is my, this is my first thing. Yeah. Not the next thing. I'm going to do it like this. <laughs> what? Anyway. Yeah. All right. Let's see. We have a question right up front. Oh, you do? Okay. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about hiring sure. um, and being in a growth company and having people who are interested in working with you. Or not hiring. Or, or, yeah, well, we right. rarely hire. We hire, hire a when you have year. to, right? Yeah, so I'm, yeah. I'm fully behind it. Of course, sometimes then you need that person yesterday when you do reach that point. Yep. So how, how do you find the right people? And then more importantly, when you're in it and you're committed, how do you pass that to them when they are on your team? Um, so it depends on the kind of job you're hiring for. But um, I would rather feel the pain of hiring some of, of hiring someone a little bit too late than too early, because I feel like when you hire people too early, you invent work for them to do, mm -hmm. and that's sort of disrespectful to somebody to be like, "What you're doing doesn't really matter. Um, mm -hmm. I need to like create stuff for you to do to keep you busy because we're gonna need you later." Mm -hmm. like, I don't, I just don't think that's a respectful thing to do. So I'd rather feel the pain and be like, "Man, I wish we could have done this sooner, but we can't. We need someone now because we can't do it on our own." And then, then you bring someone in. Um, we always like to look at someone's actual work. So if it's like we're hiring for customer service, we'll ask them to, to answer some questions that a customer might send in. If we're hiring a designer, we'll pay them for a week to do a sample project for us to see how that turns out. If we're going to hire a programmer, we typically like, it, look to, like to look at their open source contributions if they have them because you can look at real code. Always looking at real work. Um, and, uh, and that's sort of how we do that. Now, keeping people around for a long period of time, like we have someone who's working for us for eight years, someone nine, uh, someone uh, 10 years. Um, you know, we have people who've been around for a long time, most people four, five, six years, which is a long time in this industry. Mm -hmm. um, and the only way to keep people interested is to give them interesting work to do or to have them come up with interesting work to do. Every other thing is artificial because if it's just money, they'll find more money somewhere else. If it's just this one perk, they'll find that perk somewhere else. Like they, People have to be intrinsically motivated by the work that they're doing. And then you can take very good care of them at the same time. So you get this double whammy. Like, they love the work. Mm -hmm. And then, like, for example, uh, 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 May through October, we don't work on Fridays. We have four-day work weeks in summer. Um, we pay for everyone's fresh fruit and vegetables at home. So we, everyone, we pay for everyone for a CSA share, uh, no matter where they live. Um, current, for the past three years, we've sent everybody on a vacation. Um, one of 16 locations around the world, which we pick, and we pay for the whole thing. It's like four or 5000 bucks. They can go on, on their own or bring their family and there's different trips set up so we take care of people that way. That's not a promise thing, but we've been doing it and as long as we can continue to do it, we'll continue to do that. And that sends a message. It's like, we first of all, we want you to go see the world. We want you to go see something and enjoy something. Mm -hmm. Add to your perspective, be a more interesting person, those sorts of things. So we try and take care of people. We pay people above market rates. We don't give any equity though. We don't give stock. Um, I don't believe in paper money. Well, I believe in paper money. Like. <laughs> Five tens, twenties, fifties, hundreds. Like, what are you I, don't, I don't believe in in certificates. Yeah. I don't believe in in future payment. Possibly, if you hit the lottery, I, I'm just not a big fan of that. So I want to pay people now with cash they can spend at the store today. Mm -hmm. So that that's how that's how we run the company. Sure. Um, question from Twitter. From I'll make uh, my answer shorter too. So yeah, no, no, from okay. Heisei. So how much time have you spent creating a culture that is consistent with your brand and image? The culture, um, I, you I don't mentioned a bunch of things. Yeah, okay. but I don't, I don't, I don't think of, I don't think of culture as something you create. Mm -hmm. Culture is something that happens. It's mm -hmm. the byproduct of consistent behavior. Right. It's the things that you do. It's not the things that you say, you know. And so you just got to lead by example and and mm -hmm. take care of people, and um, they help you build your culture. I mean, your culture is not just you. It's right. people that are there. They form it. They shape it too. And mm -hmm. um, you just, you just. Don't try so hard to do it. Just do what you think is right and, and, and treat people well. And good things happen. Yeah. All right. Do we have another one on, right over here? I'm going to go back here. Yep. yep. Hi. You said that you don't do marketing. Right. Or you didn't. Or, I mean, we don't. You do blogs and Twitter. Would you consider that? Um, in your sense? You don't pay for marketing. Yeah, we don't. Okay, that's a good question. I, it's a, it's it's a fair question because like, what does it marketing really mean? Is it is it kind of a good question? Yeah. We don't have somebody who's in charge of it. Mm -hmm. We don't have directives. Like we don't say, this is our marketing plan. We need to blog three days a week. We need to you know, 
know, tweet 20 times a day. Like, we don't have any of that stuff. People are free to, to write on Twitter whatever they want. People are free to blog whatever they want. People are free to, to communicate any way they want. There's no censorship. There's no monitoring. There's no editors. There's no um, approval process. Um, people want to write and want to share if they want to. And if they don't, that's fine. Um, but we, we, we are active in a few different places. But it's not a strategy. It's because we want to do it. Uh, we want to share. And, and that's these. it's great that we can get the word out through these, these mediums. But there's no budget. There's no one in charge. There's no department. It's everyone's job. So, so the employees can blog for everyone. Anybody. Okay. But I, I look at marketing as more fundamental. It's actually more elemental in that marketing is everything that you do. It's that error message. When someone uses your product and something goes wrong, like how do you communicate there at that moment? It's customer service. It's pricing. Is your pricing clear? Is it confusing as hell? Like that's marketing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every moment is, is a chance to, to, to share your message and share your brand. Um, it's not about like the marketing people do that stuff. Everyone has to do that stuff. Bad software is bad marketing. Bad customer service is bad marketing. Um, so that, it's all tied together. So do you think that this would also work for larger companies? Do you think that that's going to be the future? Or? You know, um, I, I kind of, to be honest, I don't care is sort of my answer <laughs> to those questions. Because I don't, I don't care if things work for companies at 5,000 people. Because what they do doesn't work for me. What I might do that might not work for them. But I think. I think the idea that everything is marketing is absolutely valid at all scales um, because it, it, you're dealing with people. And if your product sucks, that's the worst marketing you'll ever have, period. Um, if, if you call, you know, for example, you, you call, I'm not, I don't want to pick on, on uh, a company, but so I'll say like you call Acme Cable Company and, um, and you're like, and you're on hold for like an hour, well, they, they have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to placate you after going through a shitty experience like that when they can make that first experience better mm -hmm. and, and people would love the brand and that's marketing. You know? So all those things. Hold cues. That's bad marketing. Right. You know? you, I mean, you talk about that a lot in your first book, the one that was more design focused, right? Yeah. I mean, just looking at... Screen, error messages, right. Error messages is a big yeah. thing. Let's talk about yeah. error messages. Error messages. You want to talk about error messages? Yeah. Okay. I do. Does anybody else want to hear about error messages? Yeah. yeah. You do? Totally. Yeah. Um, you have a thing for error messages. And, and well, I, I actually, what we, what we try and do with 37 Signals today mm -hmm. is, is try and create um, error-free software. And that doesn't mean bug-free software. Every software is going to have, all software is going to have bugs at some level because there's something you didn't think about. Right. But what the customer experiences is different. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if, if you don't name a to-do list in Basecamp, mm -hmm. we're not like, you must name the to-do list. <laughs> it's just like an untitled list. Like, mm -hmm. it just creates it and gives it a name, you know? Right. Things like that. Those are moments what normally would have been an error because, like, the field is null and the database, like, you know, yeah. all this weird shit that happens to the software. And so you mm -hmm. spit back some error and, like, whatever. Mm -hmm. But you have to think about those moments um, and you have to design for when things go wrong because things are always going wrong. Um, and you got to figure that stuff out. So I think, like, the idea is to smooth that over to the point where people don't see errors unless, like, something catastrophic has happened. Mm -hmm. And then they see an error. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There's a lot of questions about your hiring. Already talked about yeah, that. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, do you have one over there? There's one in the back. Let's go there. Yeah, they came out. They came out to be here. They yeah. should, unless yeah. you're tweeting your questions. Yeah, and then you can. Well, let's just over here. Everyone always wants to know, like, what's yeah. the worst thing that ever yeah, happened? What's the worst stuff? thing that's ever happened? Everyone always wants to know ever. that. Yeah. I um, blocked that stuff out. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we've made some 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 big. We haven't made like we haven't we haven't had near death experiences, um, That's good. which is good. Yeah. But we've made a, a plenty of mistakes, and I think one of the mistakes wouldn't be seen as a mistake, but it's it's trying to do too many products at once that are mm -hmm. turn out to be successful products. Right. Like these aren't mistakes. No, these products are not problem. mistakes. Yeah, yeah. But what they do is they dilute you, and it multiplies. They just they keep going, and you yeah. got to maintain them. And, yep. and, and today, it's even harder because like you can't just have like a web app. You got to have an iPhone app. You got to have an iPad app. You got to have an Android app, right. tablet, Android tablet. Yeah. The thing you know, that comes out next week app. The thing that comes out next yeah. week app. Like, yeah. you got to have all these things. So, so every product you have is like five products. And mm -hmm. so, if you have a few products, you might have twenty different products, yeah. really. Mm -hmm. And these aren't mistake products, no. but it is it is a mistake of vision mm -hmm. uh, at a certain point. And um, sometimes you got to just kind of turn turn the ship around a little bit. So 
And that's um, what you, when I first saw you speak, you were talking about doing just that, doing less, keeping it simple. Yeah, it's hard. Not having as many options and features right. and things like that. And we've still done that, right. but we have technically four or five different products now. Right. And so next year, we're going to, to slim down our product line, mm -hmm. spin a few things off, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and get back to the basics. And so I think that'll be, I'm really looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. That's, that's going to happen next year. And there'll be some other things being announced around that time, too. Are, is that a, so, I mean. So I, mean, I think that's like a long, it's like a lo slow mistake. Yeah, right. You is know? There, is there anything that just like weighs on you, though, stress-wise? Like, you, I know. Yeah, I, I'm, stuff is I'm, up scared down. Of, I'm scared of, I'm scared of security holes i'm yeah. scared of like and this is something i've instituted recently at the company um mm -hmm. so every once in a while you hear about a big breach you know mm -hmm. adobe 150 yeah. million people like or small companies whatever yeah. there's a breach right mm -hmm. and 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 you're not like ah oh, that would never happen to us you're more like i'm so glad that didn't happen to us right. um i'm kind of glad it was them and not us but like it's a terrible thing to right. thing to think but that's what yeah. you like goes through your mind like it wasn't us yeah so what, what I've decided to do is every time another company gets breached and they make a public announcement, mm -hmm. we will make an internal announcement as if we were bre breached in the same way wow. to make sure we won't, won't share this because we weren't breached, right, but to, yeah. it, we, we have to go through the exercise of writing up mm -hmm. what it would be like to communicate this breach to our customers. Right. And then by doing that, you see all these holes mm -hmm. because you're like, someone got in this way and like, we couldn't have stopped that either because mm -hmm. we don't have this whole right. plug and we don't so have this whole plug. you're looking at it from a different lens. Like you're looking at it from, oh shoot. I'm putting it. us yeah. in their shoes right. and making us go through the experience of, of writing this up because it's a terrible thing to have to do. And like, right. I want us to do that and feel it rather than be like, oh, I'm glad that wasn't wow. us. So that's practice. It's pra it's a fire drill, basically. Yeah. yeah. And because it's going to happen to every company at some right. level. It's just going to happen. And sometimes yeah. it might be huge. Sometimes it might be small. But whatever it is, if there's any cracks in the foundation, like yeah. you've got to tell your customers. Right. You can't keep that stuff hidden. That's just bad news. Yeah. So yeah. how are you going to do it? You got to get good again. Getting back to practice, you got to get good at it. And mm -hmm. you know, a great way to get good at it is to take someone else's bad experience and, and act as if it was you, mm -hmm. and, and learn how to write, learn how to communicate, and yeah. also find the holes, um, and realize that you're not as tight as you thought you might have been. Did you did I read this or did you tell us tell me this sometime? Like you got you hire writers. Like we try and hire good writers. Good writers. Yeah. So if um if we're ever deciding between two people, um, we'll always hire the better writer. Even if the one person is the person we hire is a better writer is not quite as good as the other person in their core skill, I'd still rather have the better okay. better writer. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. If there's uh, a huge discrepancy, you, no. But if it's close, better writer. All right. Got it. Okay. He's got a mic. Uh yeah. Okay. Hi, Jason. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So I work for Inside Sales for CleverSafe, Chicago data storage company. We're a customer of yours. Fantastic yep. product. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome product. Right. Yeah. So we've uh, we've had some success in some, you know, traditional use cases with like Web 2.0 and photo sharing, et cetera. And, and we really know our technology is going to be great for different use cases. For example, bioinformatics, genomic sequencing, et cetera. What, um, what is your bread and butter for your base camp app application and what do you see as greenfield like moving forward where, yeah. where you can really grow so our, our 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 customer is a customer of a small company or small group 10 people or less um working on actually what's interesting is working on pretty much anything but it's like we have people in education we have people in manufacturing we have people in in design and technology and consulting and accountants and lawyers all these different things but it tends to be small groups of people, um, either free or freelancers, a lot of individuals, um, or small groups inside big companies. And that's who we've kind of marketed to is the small groups. But there's also um, a really interesting thing that we did recently. Um, we, we, we just slapped a big price on Basecamp on this one high plan to see what would happen. And we're selling a shitload of it. Um, and what's interesting is, you, so it's an annual plan, which is our first time doing an annual plan. We've always done monthly plans. And if you take our most expensive plan and multiply it by 12, it's like 2400 bucks a year, right? Um, we made this plan $3,000 a year, which is $600 more than you would pay if you paid monthly. And usually it's the other way around. People are like, you pay in advance and you get a free month. We're like, if you pay in advance, you pay extra, basically. Um, we're giving you a few other things, too. But um, what we've seen is that we get a whole new type of customer. These are, it's very interesting how you put this thing out there. And, and the thing we also did was, which is interesting, is we said you can pay by check, which is the first time we've ever done that too. Mm -hmm. 
And now we have all these customers who are paying us by check 3,000 bucks a year because what's more important to them is not the price, but the process. They can't pay by credit card. They don't want to expense shit, but they can write a check. And so they're willing to pay a lot more for that privilege. So what I think, we're actually doing a huge research project right now on new markets. Like, where can we go? Mm -hmm. I think um, the big thing we have to figure out, or we don't have to figure out, but I'd like to figure out, is firewall install, you know, be, be behind someone's firewall and actually do an installed version of Basecamp. Well, um, that's what they were asking for 10 years ago. 10 years ago. <laughs> and the technology wasn't really around, but right. now it's, it, GitHub's yeah. done a great job with this. There's some really great yeah. ways to do this. So that's, that's a place we're looking next year, mm -hmm. um, and a variety of other things, too. I also think we have a ton of schools using Basecamp. Um, I, think, I think it's time that we give Basecamp away for free to schools. Uh, we haven't done it yet, but I think that we go in that direction. I like to hear that. Um, so I, th I think we'll probably do that next year. Uh, and we're going to find we're doing this big project. I think there'll be a lot of interesting things that come out of finding out these, these alternative markets. Is that kind of what you're asking, or did I go in the wrong direction? Okay. Yeah. It's it's crazy. It's so weird. Yeah. It's weird how how people have so hacked the product. And that's a great question. Things. What's the most unique? Instant, There's instant, this Froyo instant. place that uh, <laughs> tracks. That comes to mind. That's right. Yeah. Um, That's funny that you say that. We're actually doing a project right now to find out. I want to hear like the most obscure, unusual, weird ways people are using Basecamp. So I don't actually know. Oh. I mean, I hear weird things, but they're not that weird. But I know there's like things like that. Yeah. Um, people use it in very strange ways, though, like ways we never intended. Where they'll just like actually something's interesting. Um. Um. I think it's Steinway. Is that the big piano maker, like in the, in the northeast, still U.S. Yep. based? So they they use Basecamp, and um, the guy who uses Basecamp there is one guy. He has one project, mm -hmm. and each to-do list is a separate project. So he's like one mega huge ass project <laughs> with like dozens of different to-do lists, and each to-do list is a separate project. And that's like not the way it was intended to be used. Yeah. But that's very interesting to me right. because How if you see patterns that? like that, you yeah. go, oh, okay, there's something going on here. Maybe we can modify the product to make that more. Right. Friendly or attractable, or whatever. But um, anyway, yeah, it's, do you guys, it's do, interesting. Do, you, do you user testing? Like you guys, we don't do any it? user testing. Okay. Okay. Um, one thing I want to do next year, though, is personally talk to a lot more customers. So I want to do like these 100 customers in 30 day sprints, mm -hmm. um, where I'll just set up a schedule. People can sign up if they use our product and they want to talk to me about it. Mm -hmm. And I just spend 30 days talking to people and just. Because, but we've done we've done some research around this sort yeah. of thing, um, but we don't do any formal testing. We we found that we. We're best, we make the best stuff when we make it for us, and when we make it when we really understand the problem we're trying to solve, rather than trying to solve problems by proxy, by imagining what someone else might want. Right. Yeah. Scratching your itch. Yeah, and the other thing is, we, we just, it's weird, like 10 years into it, we just started a QA team a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and our product has gotten so much better mm -hmm. because of that. We used to launch with a lot more bugs, we hardly right. launch with any bugs now, and mm -hmm. it's really been a huge improvement. Great. Yeah. Awesome. So I'd recommend that, too, for people. Yep. Is there a roving mic, or are there, should we go I back to Twitter? I can also repeat the question if their mic's hiding. It's over here. It's hiding. Pass it. We're going to pass the mic. There's so many. There's a lot of, a lot of hiring questions. A lot of hiring questions. Know, hey, Jason. Uh, okay. You talked about your investment from Jeff Bezos. I was wondering, what are some of the great things that you've learned from Jeff over the time? Mm. So Jeff Bezos, if anyone here ever gets a chance to meet him, take that chance because he is a remarkable person. I've never met anyone like him before. Um, in that when you talk to him, you feel good for three days. It's the weirdest thing. It's so weird. It's very weird. His advice to us has always been about long-term thinking. Make the investments in the things that will not change in your business. So this is this is the best advice he's ever given me. Um, he says a lot of people are chasing trends, right? They're, 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 they're doing this, they're doing that, whatever. He goes, you got to think about the things that people want from your company in 10 years that they want today. So in Amazon's example, people are not going to wake up in 10 years at Amazon at, who use Amazon and say, I wish Amazon had worse selection. Mm -hmm. They're not going to say, I wish shipping was slower. Mm -hmm. They're not going to say, I wish uh, customer service was worse. You know, they're not going to say those things. And they're not going to say them today, and they're not going to say them ever. So if you can invest in those things, they will pay off forever um, compared to like, investing in some platform that might be around for two years and might go away in 10 years, you know? 
So for us, like people aren't going to wake up in 10 years and go, I wish Basecamp was harder to use. Mm -hmm. I wish Basecamp was slower. I wish Basecamp cost me a lot more money. Um, you know, I wish Basecamp customer service didn't get back to me in four minutes, which is, which is our current um, response time for emails, but instead takes three hours to get back to me. Like, no one's going to want that. So we're, we're investing heavily in reducing, even from four minutes, I want to get it down to like nothing. You know, like we want customer service to always be, we want our products to be faster, we want our products to be easier and simpler. And each, initial, each new version of Basecamp that we do, I want it to be simpler than the last version which means killing some features sometimes. It means rethinking some things. Like Those are the things that if we invest in now, they'll pay off today, and they'll pay off forever. And so that's, that's the best advice he's ever given me. And, and I think it's great advice for everybody. And, and, um, don't follow the trends. Follow the things that will be around forever. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll just continue to pay dividends. Good advice, really good advice. Um, I got one on Twitter here from Matthew J. Lane. So you have a product idea, and you're trying to realize it, you have it come to market. What are the next steps you take to determine, you know, which way to go and, and scale that? When it's ready to launch, you think? Uh, I know it's only 140 steps, characters, yeah, really. but yeah. Um, what are the next steps you take to determine scalability? So I guess viability, I would say, too. Yeah, I mean, you got to start selling the thing. So, like, don't give it away and ask your yeah. friends what they think of it. Right. That will tell you nothing. Mm -hmm. Actually, it'll tell you It'll tell you something. You'll just buy like the it. wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, your friends like it. It's free. Yeah. Don't give stuff away for free. People always ask how do you find? How do you know what your customers really think of your product? And the answer is you charge them for it, mm -hmm. because when people ch pay for something, they get really honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, when mm -hmm. something's for free, it's like ah, I don't give a yeah. shit. It's free. It's great. Whatever. Like they're not invested in it, so they don't really care. But if they give you thirty bucks, yeah. like they want to tell you why it's worth. Why like they want to tell you? They want to justify their expense by telling you how much your product sucks. Um, and like that's good. You want to hear that. So the best way to get feedback and to find out if something is viable is to put a price on it. It's not to put it out there and expect five thousand people to use it or ten thousand people to use it. Put a price on it. Now there are exceptions. People always go, "What about Twitter? What about Facebook?" Well, what about that's like point zero 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 percent of the companies in the world. Um, those are lottery winners, and there are lottery winners. Um, people win the lotto and mega millions too. Like there are winners um, that that have to get a massive, enormous scale. But you can also kill yourself by going for that enormous scale. Um, there's been lots of companies that are the photo sharing business specifically who try to get massive scale, and they realize it actually costs a lot of money to store stuff. Like I can't give the stuff away for free, and then they go out or they have to sell too early or whatever it is. You know, Flickr sold for twenty million bucks. Like, small number compared to a lot of the other companies that are selling today. So they had to sell. They were out of money. They couldn't make it work. Right. And so anyway, point is, is that put a price on it, and that's how you find out if it's any good. Yeah. You will not know if it's any good unless you start selling selling it. So next question would be, then, how do you figure out that first price? That first price? Yeah. I think it depends on what it is, right. obviously. Um, I mean, I think, I think the whole in-app purchasing model is very, actually very interesting yeah. on, on iOS, and yeah. maybe even more so on the web, too. That's a good model. Um, uh, I mean, the way we determine prices is we like what do we think is fair? Yeah. Seriously, we don't yeah. do a lot of research. Yeah. There are like magic numbers in pricing uh, theory, which you can read books on. Right. Jeff Bezos talked about with, with Amazon Prime. He, he priced it seventy nine dollars because he thought ninety nine just felt too too high. Right. But seventy nine was serious enough. Um, so there's like there's a lot of it's emotion. Right. A lot of it's emotion, and you just some people have it, some people don't. He has it. Yeah. Uh, but there's also like Walmart. Um, Walmart never has a nine at the end of their prices. They always have eights or sixes. Mm -hmm. And what they're signaling is we're trying to, we're working really hard to save that last penny. It's not forty nine dollars. It's forty eight dollars. It's not forty eight ninety nine. It's forty eight ninety eight. Right. And so like that's not scientific, really. Mm -hmm. It's 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 part of the brand. It's like we're working hard to save you money. We're all about low prices. Right. And so there's some you know some emotion there. And yeah. yeah. So you just got to figure out some stuff. I don't. Know, so like you know. There's also like, do you charge by the person? Do you charge like, do you give away a lot of pe a lot of seats and charge right. other things? I don't know. It all depends on the product. But the hard part is putting a price, any price, on it. Mm -hmm. um, you got to do that. Yeah. Even if it's too cheap, that's fine to start. You can always raise your prices later. Right. You can do that, and you just grandfather in the people who paid the least amount or mm -hmm. earlier. But you got to put something on it. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like you're very iterative with like everything you do. Like you try it and you figure it out. You got to try it and figure it out. You don't know. Yeah. Um, you just don't know. I mean, yeah. you guess, and maybe yeah. you hit it on the head. Maybe, yeah. maybe you don't. And, you know, but I've never been one to, to optimize the hell out of things. Like, I, I just don't. 
I'm not interested in that last 30 cents of it. Like, yeah. you know, I, I don't want to do, like, that's not interesting to me. Um, so, you know, we might, I'm sure we leave money on the table all the time. I'm sure we can charge more for Basecamp, five, yeah. five bucks or 10 bucks, whatever. Like, right. But I, I just don't, I'm not really interested in that sort of experimentation that, you know, okay. that much. At least. I'm more interested in radical business model changes than like, mm -hmm. can we make an extra two bucks off people? It's just not <laughs> interesting yeah. to me. Right. Yeah. Okay, I've got time for about two more, I okay. think. So there's one over here. Is there anybody on that side? Okay. Yep, one right here and then the one down there. Right, why don't you grab and this the one person first. furthest in the back has to be able to answer, answer a question. Is there a question back there? He has a question, so we've oh, got to get him to okay, I'll, so I'll make my more. answer short. There you go. Yeah. So uh, over here first. So uh, my yeah. name is Quentin. Thank you very much for coming here tonight. Yep. Um, kind of bucking the trend. Uh, I know you started a software company, but what advice would you have for hardware companies? I think that's something that people always need is hardware and kind of going with what you said earlier um, i'm kind of against taking initial funds yeah. uh, from someone i i like being profitable right from the get-go because that means you can make money with your product what advice would you have for a, a hardware startup first of all i'm not looking at you because there's a huge light in my eyes so <laughs> just i'll, I'll you. look this way if you yeah. don't mind okay. um uh hardware is a, a different animal because uh you, you typically you need to make tools and dies, you need to have raw material, you know, you've got those costs. So that's that's different. A lot of people go to Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or one of those things. And I think that's an interesting model, um, and I think it's, it's proven to be a very good way to get something off the ground, hardware-wise. I would I would go there before I would go to an individual investor, personally, because you retain 100% of the equity in your company, and that means you control your life. You control your timeline, you all control all that stuff. I also like the idea of getting money from people because now that means you have customers and there's a little bit more pressure on you to deliver something that's really good rather than kind of mess around in the lab. You know what I mean? Um, so so I, I'm more a fan of, of that. I would I would look at those models. If it's something that requires an, a, a massive investment um, and those ideas are out there and there are great ones out there, like you're going to build some crazy new technology, like solar tech, I don't, I don't even know, but some crazy new leapfrogging thing, you're going to need money. Like that's That's yeah. true. But... Um, I don't know what you're making, whatever. If it's if it's a commercial or a small thing or whatever, like if you can if you can try and raise money on Kickstarter, I would I would start there and see what happens. Yeah, I really would. Sure. All right, we go in the back of the room and then to the front. Okay. Uh, yeah, we use your product, so it's a great product. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I had a question. So you mentioned earlier that um, as a measuring ruler for developers, you look at their GitHub um, open source contributions. So what have you, or has Basecamp given back to the open source community as a whole? What has Basecamp given back? Yeah. The open source. Um, sure. So Ruby on Rails came out of Basecamp. Um, Basecamp was the first <laughs> Ruby on Rails uh, product ever. That'll, no, no, it's okay. Just, that'll so, do it. So, so there's that. There's that. Um, there's we, we, something we, about this. I don't know. That's fine. No, no, that's fine. Um, we, we've, we've contributed a ton. I think there's about 30 or 40 different open source projects that have come out of people who work at 37 Signals. Um, if you go to 37signals.com slash open source, you can see some of those. Um, Capistrano, which is a way that a lot of people deploy their apps. It was written by Jameis Buck, who's one of our programmers. Um, Sam Stevenson has done a ton of work. Um, who's here in Chicago, uh, open source work. He's done, he did POW. If you guys know what POW is, it's very simple. Way to, to run apps locally. Um, uh, he's done a variety of other things, RVENV, and some other things. Um, lots of open source contributions have come out of 37 Signals, and we're very, very proud of that. Our whole stack is based on open source, so we're very big believers in giving back that way as well. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, a it's a very fair question, yeah, and, didn't, didn't and, and you know, there's a lot of people who take from that world and don't give back, and I think you know that world depends on people giving back, and it's it's an important ecosystem. It's a very important thing to be part of. If, can. Yep. We don't, and, and people are free to work on open source projects during like their work time. Mm -hmm. like, it's not just free time stuff. They can do it on their own. Oh, cool. Yeah. I mean, they can do it while they're while working. They're working. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Last question. Last question. Uh, so I think you hit the nail on the head, you know, coming from design, that perfectionism, that nitty gritty really transcends, especially going into development now personally. Yeah. So I'm wondering, how do you find a potent balance between being a perfectionist and wanting to hit all the core features, but also getting that minimum viable product to market? so hard and the the best way i've found to do that is to cut back on scope so if you want to if you want to achieve an exceptionally high level of quality on something you you have to cut back on the scope of it 
Um, and that means, like, for example, if you have like 10 things you want to do with this product, you're not going to get to the MVP if you're like obsessed with the details and all 10 of those. It's going to take you a long, long time. So you guys said, we're going to do five of those things. We're going to do them exceptionally well, or we're going to do three of those things. You're going to do them exceptionally well, um, but you got to cut back on something. And it, or you got to add a lot more time, and, and that's probably not what you want to do if you're looking for like that first minimum viable product. So, scope is the best way to control those tendencies, I think. And it also forces you to really think hard about like what is this product really about? Um, what does it really do? What's it really for? What can I learn after I've launched it? You will make a lot of mistakes in some of the things that you do, and if you put a lot of time and detail, detailed work into things that don't matter ultimately it's actually really frustrating so it's kind of good to to get rid of that scope and just focus on things you know are really important um, it's hard it's really hard to do um, there's no magic answer other than like getting better at it and practicing it and this is one of the great things that if you're in it for the long haul you get you get better you become better at it and then every subsequent project you do is better and better and better because of it um, but it's hard definitely hard the other last thing i'll say about that is i've actually I'm actually really interested in in, in, um, in sort of uh, less perfect things these days, and, and um, I think that there's a I think there's a bad trend going on uh, in web design, specifically in application design, which is like at first everything's a little bit too slick, and I think it's really interesting if you look. Do I have like a few minutes? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's very interesting <laughs> if you look at um, if you look at the most successful um, soft web-based software tools mm -hmm. things. Designers would say they look like shit. Amazon mm -hmm. looks like shit. A mess, right? Craigslist, mess, yeah. right? Um, Google's gotten a lot better. Yeah. Uh, Google's design is really quite good now, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that a lot of designers would look at and go, oh my god, that sucks, yeah. or whatever, right? Well, every time I go to any Gmail. Gmail, people don't like Gmail, I mean, right? I, mean, I like it, but it's just overwhelming. Yeah. So much. Um, all these sites are like really cluttered and, yeah. and, 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 and like, a lot of designers would look at them and go, "This is this is this is bad." Yeah. But there's something to it. Uh, eBay, what a fucking mess, right? <laughs> but so successful. Yeah. Um, what like what's that about? Like, mm -hmm. I think it's a really fair thing to think, a really important thing to think about. Is that because it's more comfy? Like people feel. I like, believe it is. Yeah. I believe it's about. It's like your. Clutter is a human thing. Yeah. It's like um, your messy family room. You don't want to, you know. You yes. Clean up for your friends it feels and cozy. Yeah. It feels like there's people who made this and not right. like these artists, right. you know, like who people can't relate to. Right. You know? Um, Let's look at the painting. You know? Yeah. I, I really think yeah. so. I think yeah. there's something to it. I don't know what it is, yeah. but so I'm really personally very interested in like folksy mm -hmm. style design these days. And I'd love to see that make more of a comeback. Every website today is like this. Huge photo with parallax scrolling and like yeah. everything is like artisanal and craftsman like and beautiful and all this like all this the, even the writing is getting too perfectionismist that's the wrong that's like the word we just made it up. the writing is getting too ridiculous and precious yeah um just just write like you speak and 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 design like like people would you know also some of the best buildings in the world are made by just people who aren't architects they're mm -hmm. just like people who made something really cozy and you go into a room and like they threw it together, and it's kind of a mess. But like, you feel comfortable in those spaces more so than you feel comfortable in a museum. You know, things like that. I think there's something to that that needs to come back to to technology, and um, I'd love to see that happen. So I hope to. That's a great final thought. Cool. Thank you so much, Jason. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.